what causes gout and a plan for remission and we are starting right now. Hi, I'm Dr. Pete. I'm a PhD biochemist and I'm also a Nutrition Network advisor. In 2016, I was diagnosed with gout and then in 2019, I was diagnosed with prediabetes. I went on to the ketogenic diet and in 52 days, I reversed my diabetes based on my fasting glucose and my A1C. And now I have put my gout in remission. Over the past few months, I have published a collection of videos that provide a concise explanation of gout. And those videos are linked up here. In today's episode, I am going to summarize the gout hypothesis and offer an outline that you can use to plan gout remission. So if you want a meaningful scientific way to end the pain, keep watching. So what is the gout hypothesis? In the joint where the gout flare is going to happen, we need a source of uric acid. Either it arrives by circulating uric acid and then diffuses into the synovial fluid or it has to be produced by cells that are in the cartilage, most likely the chondrocyte. Next, we need systemic inflammation with the expression of junk one. This can happen in two ways. Either it happens in the chondrocyte due to the presence of uric acid, or it happens in resident innate immune cells like the monocyte, the neutrophils, and the macrophage that are resident cells in the synovial fluid of the cartilage. So to summarize right now, in the joint, we have uric acid and we have the systemic inflammation going on with the expression of junk one. Now what's gonna happen due to the presence of the uric acid, the NLRP3 inflammasome is going to be stimulated to undergo formation and that's going to require the presence of junk one and also the cytokine IL-1 beta. So what are the two main factors that we ingest that cause this cascade of inflammation that generates the gout flare that causes us so much misery and pain? And those substances are alcohol and sugar. And I just use the term sugar in a broad sense. So to be very clear about this, I'm referring to cane sugar, which is glucose and fructose bonded together by a covalent bond. I am talking about high fructose corn syrup, which is a mixture of glucose and fructose. Usually the high fructose corn syrups contain significantly more fructose than glucose. Usually at minimum, there will be about 55% fructose in a mixture of high fructose corn syrup. I'm talking about agave syrups, which are super bad. They are usually composed of fructose levels that are 80% or more. And then I'm talking about just about any packaged or processed food that you pull off the shelf. What you need to understand is that it is the alcohol and the fructose component of the sugar that is causing the sudden acute rise in uric acid intracellularly that is causing the, the uh, inflammational cascade and junk one expression that leads to the gout flare. So in any eating plan where we want to put gout in remission, we're going to need to eliminate the alcohol and the fructose from our diet. Additionally, it would be nice if we had an eating plan that in itself would inhibit the formation of the NLR P3 inflammasome in the joint. And I know that you know where I'm headed with this. I've been on the ketogenic diet for the last three years. And in my way of thinking, this is the eating plan 
that you want to go with if you want gout remission because it eliminates the sugar, you make the choice to eliminate the alcohol, and it cuts into the carbs. I will come back to that concept in a minute. It lowers systemic inflammation, which means we're going to lower junk one, uh, which is good because that's going to inhibit formation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. And then lastly, one of the beauties of the ketogenic diet, because we have lowered the carbs and because we brought the insulin expression down, our body has shifted into the fat burning mode. And as a result of that, we're producing a family of fat molecules called ketones. And these ketones include a molecule that's called beta-hydroxybutyrate. And recently, beta-hydroxybutyrate was shown to actually inhibit formation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. So now let's turn to the last of the details that I want to cover on the ketogenic diet in this particular video. First and foremost, make sure that you have doctor supervision. The main reason for this is that when, as a gout sufferer, when you shift onto the ketogenic diet, you're going to see an initial rise or spike in uric acid. And the reason that this happens is because when we lower the carbs and we lower the insulin expression and you produce the ketones, the ketones are organic acids. And when they enter the circulatory system and make their way to the kidneys, they're going to be preferentially excreted into the urine, blocking the excretion of uric acid. So when you shift onto the ketogenic diet as a gout sufferer, there is a uric acid spike that eventually is going to come down. But during the time period when you have that shift or rise in uric acid, the gout sufferer is vulnerable on the ketogenic diet to having a gout flare. So you need to consult with your doctor and make sure that you have anti-inflammatories available so that you can get through that gout flare and get keto adapted, which usually takes about two to three months. Your eating plan should be about 5% carbohydrates, 20% protein, and the rest 75% fat. I have published a whole slew of videos on the ketogenic diet and you can find them linked here. Monitoring biomarkers is super important. I recommend buying a handheld meter and monitoring your uric acid. You want to collect values for fasting levels. You also want to test your uric acid before meals and after meals. And you also want to test your uric acid before and after exercise. Because all of the things that I just mentioned will produce uric acid. And one of the things that you'll want to do in your journey is to come to an understanding what your uric acid fluctuations are as best you can over the course of a 24-hour day. Lastly, one of the main reasons that you actually want to monitor your uric acid, and I already talked about this, initially you're going to have a spike. Over time, that uric acid should start to come down. For some of us, that uric acid has descended into the normal range of the reference range. But for some of us, and that would be me and others like me, we still are hyperuricemic. And what that means is that where our uric acid comes down to, that we're still at the upper end of the reference range. So it's important for you to monitor your uric acid. So down the road, you can have a conversation with your doctor about whether or not you want to take a uric acid lowering drug in order to bring your uric acid down into the middle of the reference range. Thank you for watching this presentation. If this is the first time that you have joined us, please hit the subscribe button and also the bell next to it so you will know the next time we publish a video.